Hello everyone, you're joining me, your host, Max Pears. But not only me, we've got the returning, the myth, the legend, the man himself, Chris Tartan. How are you doing? Good. I feel like you're really overselling me there. <laughs> hey, you know, it's the way that I get people riled up, give them a good introduction, everyone gets a little smile on their face. How are you doing, man? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm doing really well. Um, you know, like we were talking about before the show, you know, trying to keep safe, trying to be well and and come up with fun things to help people learn awesome things about games and level design. Yeah, man. And I can imagine it's been a, a very fun one for you because for those who may not know that uh, you're, you've got a, a, I think the term is masterclass, right, on GDC, which is great to hear about, mate. Congratulations. But first, let's have a quick word from today's sponsor. <laughs> today's sponsor is none other than me. What I've done, everyone, and I hope you're excited for this, is I've actually created a level design kind of store. What I've done in this store is put up different kinds of tips and tricks that you can find there, whether that be my actual ebook itself to that of level design pamphlets focused on different things such as traversal, stealth, breaking into the industry, as well as different talks that I have done which you cannot find anywhere else other than on this store. So if you are looking to improve on your level design skills and processes, then check out the level design store, which will be down in the description below where there'll be a link to find this. All you need to do is head over to gumroad.com forward slash level design lobby. I hope you like what you see and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. And now back to the show. Thanks. Yeah, I was I was really honored when when they asked me um, to do that. And they gave me kind of like open ended uh, requirements, I guess. But the interesting thing with it was, you know, they were like, well, it should be a little technical, but I didn't want to just do like an unreal tutorial or something. Um, So I tried to think about like, well, what am I what do I do in level design? You know, I, I really you know, and like we talked about last time I was on with the card game, sometimes I find level design in like weird places like, oh, well, this is actually a good time to think about pacing, or this is a good time to think about um, puzzle density, you know, like density of of challenges or something like that. Um, And so I was like, well, why don't I make it about like, let's try a few little tools and make it like a prototyping class, like what kind, what can you prototype on tabletop? What can you prototype in twine? What can you prototype in a 2d engine? And then, you know, some stuff with like, you know, doing spatial things with 3d maybe uh, towards the end, but I wanted to have it be kind of like it, it wouldn't work if I just did something that you can get on YouTube. Right. So I wanted to try something out. So I'm, I'm hoping it pays off, you know, we'll see. I'm sure it will, mate. You know, taking chances and showing something different, I think, is always great as well for not only the the viewers and consumers, but for yourself as well. Like, I'm sure you learned something cool along the way as well, mate. Yeah, I, you know, so one of the tools that I'm using, for example, is this uh, engine that I recently started toying around with called GB Studio. Um, And, like, I, I downloaded it because it's a, it's a game engine that lets you like the output is Game Boy ROMs. Oh, wow. So like, yeah, no, it's amazing. And, <laughs> you know, you make little Game Boy games and you either play them on an emulator or I bought like a, a cartridge flasher and like a oh, blank cartridge. Well, that's so cool. It's it's a lot of fun. But um, and I mean, like making in some spare time, like a little Zelda esque game called Kudzu. Uh, oh, which I put up on itch.io. But brilliant. Yeah, but like, you know, what you're doing when you're doing that, you're laying out all the rooms in your levels. And I mean, those are level, that's level design. And it's funny to me when 
you know, I hear people be like, yeah, you know, the industry mostly focuses level design on 3D. So level design is 3D. And it's like, no, what? No. <laughs> oh, dude, I've heard this uh, many times offline. We were talking about uh, my, my book, Let's Design Combat. And it's so funny when I hear people say similar things of like uh, that of, uh, oh, well, you know, this could only really be applied for 3D. And it's like, no. Like the, my favorite example, I think was it was uh, was it Liz England or am I getting the names mixed up? But I think she referenced your book in her GDC talk from where how she went from uh, Hyperlight Drifter to then it, it was Insomniacs. I've forgotten what it was. It was the very oh. uh, fun uh, Sunset Overdrive. It was Lisa was, Brown. Lisa Brown. Sorry, I, got, I was yeah. getting confused there. But that um, to me, like, open it should open people's minds. Like you can translate so much. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and and think about like Nintendo's talk about Breath of the Wild, where they were like, you know, we made basically NES Zelda to test some of these ideas out. And then we, you know, put it into the next engine. Um, I'm even having my students do that for their um, their current project that they're working on at the time of this recording. You know, saying that for the people that listen to this in the future. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, but like, you know, there, I, I teach a game prototyping class mm. and, you know, a lot of it is really just like, let's sample some smaller engines and understand, like make you understand, you know, how you, what you can get, even if you are making something kind of like big and three dimensional and, you know, big, like AAA quality, how you can get something out of just being like, well, you know, what does it feel like to have this sequence of puzzle combat you know, reward or downtime puzzle combat, you know, bam, bam. And you kind of test out like, when does a player feel overwhelmed? When does a player feel like, you know, mentally tired? Like what's the right amount of stuff to do? Um, You know, how can you, uh, and uh, so I even like wrote a little uh, article on medium and uh, on Gamma Sutra. Awesome. About, yeah. About like the level design of this Game Boy game. Cause it was like an exercise in that sort of Metroidvania thinking where it's like, well, if you're going to pass through this place a bunch um, and that could, you know, think about that in any game, you know, you want to have areas where you have to like go into these side areas that you have to explore and get through, but then maybe you unlock, you know, the central like actual route where you will be doing the back and forth through the area and you get to skip all the stuff that like took you a long time the first time. And that can be in top down, that can be in 3D, 2D, side scrolling, anything, um, you know, like making, I guess, sort of like open lanes of commuting through the game environment, unlockable itself. And, but, you know, it's stuff that you can do in, in these tools. So it's, yeah, you can figure everything out. That's incredible. As you can, like you said, there's so much tools available for us. It's incredible just to think about that. But the, speaking more about incredible things, mate, we got on here because we want to talk about something that you've got brewing with many of your other, you know, amazing stuff and projects going on. Is that of your upcoming Kickstarter projects, mate? Little Nemo and the Nightmare Fiends. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to be here to talk about it because, um, you know, it's an exciting project from an artistic standpoint, from kind of like an animation and comics history standpoint, um, and also from like architecture and game design, because, uh, you know, I mean, I guess I should explain what Little Nemo is. So Little Nemo in Slumberland is a comic strip from... Uh, 1905 that was originally published in the New York Herald newspaper and by a, a guy named Windsor McKay, uh, who is a pioneer of comics. Like uh, comic strips were like a really new thing at the time, um, you know, branching off of these just like funny page, you know, cartoons in, in papers and magazines, but then turning into like a whole section and then the, the form of having like frames and speech balloons and all these other stuff, uh, all these other things was like still kind of new. So, um, you know, he'd been, this is not his first comic strip. He'd been doing others like 
you know, first in Cincinnati and, uh, and then in New York uh, for several years before that. But Nemo was really this tour de force of, you know, experimenting with the layout of the page. Um, also, you know, uh, the content and the storytelling, you know, where other comics were just like single gags. It was these like long story arcs of, of, you know, Nemo trying to get to Slumberland or, you know, um, tours through like Jack Frost's ice palace and things like that. Uh, so it was really an innovative thing. And McKay eventually went on to be a pioneer in the field of animation, um, because he was, you know, one of the first people to invent, for example, what we call now, uh, frame to frame or pose to pose animation, um, you know, and all these things that like we kind of take for granted today, um, you know, through, you know, many like short cartoons. He made one called Gertie the Dinosaur, uh, which was like a huge influence on Walt Disney and things like that. Um, so that's what Little Nemo is all about. Um, what we're doing is Little Nemo and the Nightmare Fiends, which is a video game adaptation of this comic strip. So we are taking on the visual art style of this comic book or of, of this comic strip, um, which has actually been very difficult. <laughs> um, Windsor McKay is a very good artist. And so I've had to, I've had to stretch my legs a bit. Um, but, you know, we're, we're doing it with all hand-drawn animation. It's going to be done in a sort of, uh, I don't want to say Metroidvania. Uh, it's going to maybe be more of like, uh, I don't know, Shantae sort of style where there's like a hub and then there's like these little exploratory, like s small exploratory areas, but you can still kind of like explore. Um, you know, you have four playable characters, each with different abilities. And, you know, those character abilities are going to influence like where you can go in different parts of the levels. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the basics, I guess. Oh, I, I, I realized that was kind of long, but <laughs> no, no, mate, this is perfect. The more we, we know, because I'm definitely, I didn't know much about little Nemo or, or how, it, how it was formed prior to your, your announcement on it. So this has been fascinating for me to learn, especially like to say that someone who, who had the hand in this then inspired Disney. And then, as you said, had elements to to inspire how we still to this day have animation in, in, in some form or fashion. So that's incredible to hear all of that. And I guess yeah, that made, like, sorry, sorry, you go on, mate. Oh, I was going to say like, and that's the beautiful thing about public domain is that mm. this work is just out there for use. Um, wow. on, on the flip side though, you know, there, there comes like an immense responsibility where you either say like, well, I'm going to totally reimagine this thing or you have to, you have to really do it right. Um, mm. so that you can like properly do the original justice. And that's one of the things that we really want to want to do with this. I was going to say, do you feel like any, I don't want to use the word pressure cause I don't want to add it on, but like you said, you want to do this right, you know, and to, to take on someone else's, uh, projects in, in a form, right. You still have the creative freedom, with it being this, with it being the the medium of video games, but like, how do you? I guess, do you ever feel that pressure, or how do you tackle that if you do ever feel that way, mate? Um. <clears throat> so, what's interesting about this, like IP in particular, is that there was this little period in the '80s where there was a Little Nemo animated movie, and based on that animated movie, that is sort of like a. I, I guess I would say it's a cult classic. Um, you can actually get it for free on YouTube, but um, at the time it like failed massively. Um, and to pay off the debts from making it, the studio that made it had to like take out contracting projects. And that's actually um, <clears throat> a lot of like really great Saturday morning cartoons in the eighties or in the nineties are because Nemo failed and like, the studio had to get contract work elsewhere. Wow, this is insane. Yeah, but from that movie came a video game for the NES called Little Nemo the Dream Master that a lot of people also remember. Um, and so there is this like, 
this fan base for it. So it, but you know, for these things that we can't, <laughs> that we can't um, work with, because those are copyrighted, but you know, there is this balance of you want to make those fans happy. So you want to have references or you want to have little things that, that embody the spirit of those things, but you also don't want to overstep your boundaries. Um, and you want to stick with the stuff that is public domain. Um, so we're using that as a stepping off point to, you know, maybe make like rethink some of those things that worked and didn't work in the, in the movie and the NES game, um, to capture those fans imagination. But again, like try to do honor to the original stuff and maybe even like make it something where people can be exposed to the original for the first time. Um, but yeah, in terms of like, do we have pressure? We have pressure from like, you know, the, I, I think pressure is a good way to put it because we, we want to please the audience of the newer stuff. Um, we, but we also really want to explore the world of the older stuff, especially since it was so influential and we want to, you know, like, like I said, do it justice. No, man, I think that's a great way to, to do it is like you said, do it justice, but also understand, you know, it's a new medium, new time period. So you're going to adapt it with that. So I think that's great. Then if you don't mind me asking, cause you said about a uh, public domain as well, how did this come to be? What was it that made you come and go this, this world, this universe is the one that inspires you. So I, I mentioned the NES game and I remember renting it as a kid. Um, like I remember seeing it on the rental rack at the grocery store and being like, Oh, what's this? Oh, it's a Capcom game. Okay. I like Capcom games. Let's, let's try it out. And I rented it a few times. I liked it. I don't know why it stuck with me. Like I remember, um, I, I don't remember like the first time I saw the comics, but I remember like it was through maybe like trying to look up the NES game or something like that. But from that, I learned what this comic was. And I mean, I was blown away, you know, um, I encourage anybody that's listening to like, go look these up. Uh, they are gorgeous. Um, they are, they are pieces of art where, like I said, you know, the, the frame layout is really experimental. You know, you got to remember it's like 1905 um, and, and comic strips were a new concept. Um, but it's also drawn in this style um, called Art Nouveau, which is this graphic style that was popular in the early 20th century, late, late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and it's just this like incredibly clear visual style. And McKay was a master of, of perspective and would create these like architectural fantasy landscapes in, in uh, a style called the Beaux-Arts, which is sort of like neoclassicism. Um, but it was used in the this like important piece of American architecture um, that was the you know 1893 Columbian Exposition, which is like a World's Fair um, that was in Chicago, and you know which there would have been postcards and and art books distributed really widely uh, at the time. So McKay clearly was really inspired by this, and I think he actually did. Did he? I can't remember. I think he did live in Chicago for a very short period, but um, you know he would have been aware of this and seen it, and it clearly had an impression on him because he turned it into this like whole series of of architecture landscapes, which you know, as you can imagine, someone like me makes a huge impact on. <laughs> um, so when I, upon realizing it was public domain, it was like this should be a video game because um, I do that with everything. So, <laughs> you know, so that, you know, I, I sat down and did a design document and was like, oh, this scope is way too big. <laughs> um, but then like years later, so like within the last few years, uh, spoke like talked to some friends who they were like, yeah, we should do that. I'm like, okay, I guess we're doing it now. Um, yeah. So, you know, pretty excited about that. That's awesome, mate. No, that's great. It just came together and just yeah just also when you mentioned about was it 1905 when it first came to be and you're saying like comics were a new thing as well that baffles my mind because we're so used to them and it's so mainstream currently right now with how you know 
superhero films have come to to be pop culture. Mm-hmm. It's just you know an evolution of that, and just well, how it's all come to be, right? Yeah, and it's also because it's not it's not a superhero comic. Mm. Um, it has this more Wizard of Oz style setting where it's it's about a kid's dream. So like the plot of the comic is that um you know Nemo goes to sleep and then something kind of wonderful or surreal happens. Mm-hmm. Um like there's there's one one of the most famous ones is that he's lying in bed and then uh you know one of his like slumberland friends appears next to him and then the bed gets up on its legs and the legs keep growing and growing. And then the bed like walks out the door where the legs continue to grow and they become these like long spindly uh, legs and it starts galloping like a horse and, and bucking wildly. And he has to like hang on, but then they go through like a journey, you know, through Nemo's town and like they, it climbs the, the bed climbs on top of the rooftops and like starts going across the rooftops. It's amazing. Um, yeah. Or like one where, you know, uh, like a giant it's, uh, Thanksgiving. It's like one of the Thanksgiving comics and a giant Turkey picks up Nemo's house and carries Nemo's house around. And then Nemo falls out of the house and lands in a, you know, river of cranberry sauce, uh, you know, in a, in a forest of celery, um, because, you know, that's the Thanksgiving comic strip and it's, so yeah, it's these like really, really amazing set pieces, um, that are, that are just bizarre. <laughs> oh man. It's just great imagination that honestly, just, I so I definitely could think of worse dreams than go getting picked up by a turkey and swimming in cranberry sauce. <laughs> definitely well, think of worse I- ones. So actually, that's one of the funny parts about this, too, though, is that he has mentioned he had other comic strips before that. One of them was called uh, Dream of the Rarebit Fiend. And basically, it was it was very similar to Little Nemo, except I would say it's like the dark grown up version of Nemo, where like Nemo's dreams are sometimes scary, um, but they're also adventures. Imagine they were just scary. (laughs) And some of them are like twisted, you know, um, and, and the, the conceit is always that the person ate something weird, like ate rich food before going to bed. And then it made them have weird dreams. Right. Okay. Damn. Yeah. That'd be fascinating to learn to, you know, I'll have to check this out because there's so much about this that I definitely don't know. So I'll definitely be looking into this. Yeah. So I want to ask them, cause you mentioned about the architecture. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you being you obviously that draws great inspiration for you mate so do you kind of want to break down like the architecture how you see it and like what inspires you from that to turn it into a video game standpoint so this is actually one of the really um interesting things about again working with public domain is that like i said we can there is a freedom to reinterpret and you know on one hand you could take and i think there is like some sort of talk about a little Nemo adaptation on Netflix or something like that, where Jason Momoa is playing one of the characters. (laughs) Like I've I've seen articles about this. I don't know what, what happened to it, but, um, but you know, you have the freedom to totally reimagine. So what we're doing with that is, you know, we're looking at this as a piece of media it's like we're looking at this from the standpoint of it is 1905, but we are very aware we're looking at it in 2021. Right. And what does that mean? It means we can like look at everything that's come in the middle and say like, well, what if Windsor McKay did have this thing that came from something that he influenced? So a good example, you know, I mentioned animation. So, Um, you know, it's just general good practice when you do animation to use what are called the 12 principles of animation, which were laid out by, you know, like Walt Disney studios about, you know, things you do when you're animating characters to give them the feeling of life and, you know, things from like anticipation of motions to, you know, squash and stretch to give them a sense of weight. 
Um, those things are implied in McKay's animation, but they weren't really written down until decades later. So we want to say like, well, what if we, you know, let's really push these aspects of it to, of the animation to, you know, say like, what if Windsor McKay, but with, you know, these more modern techniques, we're, we're doing that with the architecture as well, where, you know, McKay clearly had an eye for, for great architecture, but you can also tell like where his influences are. So, and, and a lot of them do come from like American architecture from the late 19th century. So because that's such a huge theme in his works, we're looking back and thinking, well, you know, what if McKay had access to these other things? So one example that I've been hitting kind of hard in the art so far, um, and this is not to say it's the only one that we're going to hit. It's just what I've been exploring um, is there's a architect from Barcelona uh, named Antoni Gaudi, which I've always really liked. Um, and people might be familiar with a church he did that's actually still in construction uh, called La Sagrada Familia, which is in Barcelona. Yes, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, Um so, you know, he was building, he was designing and building during McKay's time. So it's like, well, what if McKay did have access to that? So, you know, there are little areas where like, I'll add something from Park Güell or, or Sagrada Familia or some of the, uh, you know, houses he did to kind of like, it diversifies the architecture a bit. You know, one thing that that I've mentioned, um, so there's a ongoing like social media research project about Little Nemo called Welcome to Slumberland and people are free to, you know, respond to it. And that actually helps the the researcher out, uh, the guy um, getting his PhD. Awesome. We'll put like a link to that in the description down below for people. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure Zach would love that. At Lover Design Lobby, we believe everybody has a story to tell. Hobbyist or student, freelancer or veteran, we made it our mission to unite those who share our passion for creating and developing great games. Thanks to our generous Patreon backers, we've been able to do just that. So if you've already pledged your support, thank you. If not, you too can ensure the future of Level Design Lobby helping us to create even more exciting content, collaborations, interviews, and much more. With awesome perks and rewards, whether you're a seasoned professional or just getting started, you're sure to find something for you. Want to share tips, tricks, and advice with passionate, like-minded developers? Our awesome community Discord has you covered. Fancy practicing your level design, creating strong portfolio content, and having fun? Then try our level design weekends. Or perhaps you want to individually discuss your work, hone your skills, or level up your career. Then consider our one-on-one -on -one mentorships. If you share our vision, then go to patreon.com forward slash level design lobby for more information and to pledge your support. Thank you. One of the things that I've mentioned in it is like, you know, you can really tell he leans on that one style really hard. And boy, wouldn't it be great if he had access to some of these other things um, to create some visual variety you know, we are, that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to be like, well, can we create these other spaces that have this visual variety? Um, not only for, you know, the what if pur purposes, but also just for like good game development practice. Like we want the sky level to be different mm. from the ice level, different from the slumberland level and the yeah. forest level and, and all those other things. No oh, man, it sounds like there's a lot. It's like anything, right? There's a lot to consider with that, and, uh, and and especially in terms of like feeling similar that you grasp what's going on versus that of like the differences you said in the overall feel of the level. And I wanted to ask you because we spoke briefly about this offline, mate. Is we're talking about how like mechanics influence the level design, right? It's like levels are built around not only the flow of the narrative but also that of the mechanics to make sure that they, the player experiences the best version of them. And I know you've, you're kind of in the early stages, as you said, mate. Like, how are you finding, finding that with your design process so far? What we're doing is, I mentioned four unique characters, and, and I can explain them a little bit. So first we have Nemo. Uh, he is your sort of Mario. 
you know, your rounded guy. And, um, you know, he is, his thing is that he can like glide in the air. So he has a sort of, think of knuckles in Sonic the Hedgehog where you can like go in the air and then glide. We're also playing around with some other things. I would say he's actually ironically the least set up in terms of like, we have the glide, the glide feels really good, but we also had some other ideas we're going to prototype, um, you know, that I don't want to like promise here, but you know, we're also kind of like figuring, trying some other things out with him too. But, you know, so he, he does those things. Then you have the princess of slumberland and, you know, so one of the things we wanted to do with this was, you know, well, let me explain the characters, then I'll explain what we're doing with it. So the princess, what she does is uh, she has like a sort of princess peach float, you know, where you jump and then you can like hover for a limited amount of time uh, in a straight line. And, you know, we wanted to really think about like what kind of passages and things like that could get you through. Um, and she also attacks with like a projectile. So then you have Flip who is a character from the co original comics. So the first three are characters from the original comics. Um, and Flip is like Nemo's best friend, but he's also this like mischief making character that annoys everybody else. And he's this like clown. Um, so what he does is he has uh, spring loaded boxing gloves. So he, you know, punches, you know, enemies um, and he can punch from a distance, but he also can use those boxing gloves to grapple and swing. So he has like a swing type of mechanic. Um, and then the last character we have is an original character created for the game named Peony. And what she does is she's sort of this like special forces um, bodyguard type character. And what we use, the way we do that is like she can climb up walls and she also lays bombs to attack. Um, so she's a lot of fun. Now, what we're doing with the four characters is um, there's this NES game called Little Samson, which is famous both for being like visually impre or visually impressive, pretty cool, but also being super rare and and like every cartridge goes for two thousand dollars or so. And Jeez Louise, why is it worth yeah, so much? Wow, it's ri it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, the collector's market's nuts, <laughs> but. What we did with that was, and that was actually part of the other, the other part of the inspiration. We we're like, oh, Little Nemo's public domain. Cool. What should we make? Hey, Little Samson's hard to buy. We like it. Let's make a Little Samson game, but with Nemo. And we've since like, it's not purely Little Samson, but the idea of four different characters is still definitely there. And swapping out the characters, you know, allows you to maybe like get into areas that you couldn't get into like with you know before you had that character on your team so that's that's what we're thinking about with the level design and each of these characters capabilities you know opens new things up so like peony is going to help you you know go vertical with her climbing you know nemo can get through certain styles of passages or you know can like get you across long distances. The princess can do something similar, but straight ahead. Um, the other thing we're doing with it though, is that, you know, we are making it so that the characters can be swapped out at any time with like an asterisk, you know, we're going to stop you from doing it like in the middle of flip swing or something. But we, you know, our intention is that you can start to like chain these these movements um you know so that's i guess big reveal in the podcast <laughs> uh, we got it we got the reveal boys <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so that's what we're designing around is this idea that like you can swap between them and we've got some good combinations already going you know right now like the most fun is you know flip swing into nemo or princess and so we're looking at these characters as kind of like how do these set up for each other um, and what do you do with that? So that's, that's going to be a fun part of the level design. But in order to do that, we are almost like setting up, it's almost like we're sketching out patterns and then we have to try the patterns and then, you know, then you can kind of like take the patterns and spread them throughout the world so that you can, you can walk into an, a zone and be like, oh, 
I need the princess, you know, oh, I need flip, you know. Right, and, okay. Yeah. So that's that's one of the things that we're really hitting hard is this idea of like, you know, um, and this is where I say we're breaking from from Samson a little bit. Like little Samson's levels are and it, you know, the one of the designers from Little Samson was the guy who created Mega Man, not like not Inafune, um, who like artistically created Mega Man, but um, I can't remember his name, but the guy who was like the programmer on Mega Man. And uh, cause it was all Capcom people that went and founded. Their yeah. Own yeah. Cause they released, um, forgot like something X eight or something. Cause they did a kickstart for that for a while back. If I remember correctly, I think so. Kind of like a, a, you know, an unofficial sequel, should we say? Oh, uh, wait, are you talking about, uh, Mighty Number no. Nine. That's the one. Or am I getting no, confused? I, I'm, here? I'm talking like back in the NES days. Ah, uh, right. Sorry, man. I'm, yeah, my bad. No, it's all- <laughs> um, but you know, the thing with Samson is that like they're Mega Man levels. They are very like linear platforming levels, and we wanted to, you know, with these characters, we we're like, oh well, you know, now we're getting into like Monster World, Shantae, kind of like we just wanted it, it to be. A little more open than that than just linear levels so that's you know what we're doing there so we're trying to establish that and then the other thing we're doing is um going back to mckay we're looking at like mckay's comics are weirdly video gamey because it's like every comic strip has a setting and some sort of like gimmick Right. And that's like how little Nemo comics are kind of constructed um, is that like he'll be in a forest and there are giants chasing him with clubs or, you know, he'll be in an ice palace and snowmen are throwing snowballs like there's a snowball fight, like snowmen having a snowball fight. And then they start throwing the snowballs at little Nemo and his friends. So there is always like a setting and a gimmick of sorts. And those situations actually make in terms of set pieces for level design like they give us a lot of ideas because now we get start getting into like mechanisms where um you know we have you know in our teaser trailer we have a shot of in our forest level these giants that do kind of like timed they like smash their clubs against the ground and you just have to like run in between like when their their clubs are up uh, or jump over the club so, you know, those are nice little like set PC things. And actually we took a little bit of uh, inspiration from another Capcom game, uh, which was uh, Magical Quest starring Mickey Mouse because they have similar. Like, oh, treat. yes. Right. OK. But we have other ones like in concept art right now that, you know, we've got some of the sprites for them. We haven't implemented them yet, but there's one comic where there's this bridge Nemo has to cross, but the bridge is actually just held up by these guys that hold up these giant concrete slabs. And, you know, Nemo starts to cross and they're like, Hey, let's mess with this kid. And then they start like shaking the slabs. Um, and Nemo falls. And then every strip, by the way, always ends with Nemo falling out of bed, um, like waking up and falling out of bed. That's like the end of comic gag. So, you know, it usually is like he will fall from something and then he will wake up on the floor. So, yeah, Nemo falls a lot. (laughs) But, you know, so we're like, oh, well, that's clearly a level thing. That's, you know, clearly we have to have like platformers that, you know, platforms where these guys like lift up their slab and then duck and then like, you know, maybe get tired and put it down and then lift it up. Um, but you can start to see how those become like challenges and then you pair them with the character abilities and you start like, Oh, okay. You know, you, you get, you get levels, uh, level ideas from that. So it's really rich in that way. Yeah. No, man. I mean, it sounds like a great resource for sure. Like there's so much to it. And obviously with the different forms that it has been released with as well is fascinating. The thing I like too is that it helps us get away from stereotypes. So, and I, and I want to I wanted to address that on your podcast because I have said ice level several times, <laughs> and I realize if if people haven't shut the podcast off yet, um, what that means is that like you know, 
there are comic strips where you know the gag is that they're on a slippery floor but we are not interested in like slippery ice level for example but there are so many other fun things that you can do with snow that are in you know these comics that we're like okay well it's going to be a setting don't worry it's not going to be slippy slidey <laughs> annoying level you know we want it to be like again snowmen flinging snowballs and maybe a blizzard and you know these other things that aren't aren't the you know because again we're saying like forest level sky level but we want to break those stereotypes but again because the tropes haven't been established yet in 1905 mckay had all kinds of other weird ideas where it's like let's do those those are cool no man that sounds fascinating i think if you had said water level everyone would have left at that point mate you saved <laughs> you saved it with ice had it been water we would have been in a different story mate oh, i was gonna say the nemo nes game has a water level and there are like water arcs in the comic but i i drew the line i was like <laughs> no we're not doing a water level you've got to, at one point mate. you got to realize you know the risk versus reward <laughs> it's not there it's not there but i mean i don't want to take up too much of your time because i know you are a, a, a busy man mate so i want to ask for like the last question for you because this is coming out in kickstarter and you've had some success already with your previous campaign on kickstarter and with it become so much of a, a mainstream for a lot of games. I'm wondering, mate, do you have any like top three or top five tips when if you're going to do a Kickstarter, what are some good things to do? Well, and, and I said I'd, I'd do this. I mean, I, I can hardly call myself a expert. I'm not, my, my game studio is not one of those ones that have had like, you know, because there are some game studios that that is what they do. They like do all their stuff on Kickstarter. So it's almost like, Oh, it's Tuesday. Time for another Kickstarter. Um, it's it's That's really only a Wednesday task for me, mate. But I see why it's on Tuesday, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, it is. I think I'm not one of those like super funder type people on Kickstarter. In fact, like I've had one unsuccess and one success. But what I have learned from the unsuccess and the success is, you know, really have a team oriented approach to like setting up the whole thing, like know that it is going to be a lot of work. First of all, um, your Kickstarter is when you're doing your Kickstarter, it is your full-time job for your game development. And it's almost like, you know, I know for right now with Nemo, we're, we are super excited for the, the Kickstarter to be launched. Um, because then we can actually like maybe, get back to making some game content because right now we're setting up the Kickstarter. We're, you know, instead of doing animation all the time, I'm making graphics for the page or, you know, video transition animations for the trailer or, you know, something like that. So, you know, but accept when you do that, that it is going to be your job to set up this page because the more you, the better you can make it look, the, the more professional it's going to come across um, you also want to get like buy-in and approval from everybody because a, a mistake that I made with my first one is that we all kind of worked separately. And so, you know, if somebody makes, if somebody like structures the rewards poorly or something like that, I mean, that could like sort of sink you, right? Because it is hard to to make a game's budget, uh, you know, a video game's budget on you know, $20, um, you either need like a ton of people or you need, you know, to like structure your reward so that there's something good provided for people that go in for a little bit more than that. And that's, that's one of the things that we really worked on was like, what can we provide really cool rewards? And I think we've got pretty good ones, like, you know, the game, but also maybe, uh, you know, art books and soundtracks, digital and non-digital, you know, after you get, over the proverbial like hundred dollar level, then you start getting into the physical stuff like posters and shirts and the physical art book. And um, we've even got some like high end stuff like animation cells and you can be added to the game as a character, either animated or unanimated. You can get your character into it. You can get, you can make a monster, things like that. Uh, and, you know, we also have like, we want to reward people who 
you know, back for other levels too. Uh, one thing that we did learn is like, you know, those smaller levels can also be really meaningful. Uh, cause with La Mancha, you know, it was nice getting the, like the print and play ones. Right. So for Nemo, you know, if you donate, like we'll, we'll put you in the credits. Um, you know, and that's pretty standard now. Uh, I, I don't think I'm really saying anything that people would be surprised by, but you know, we also have like exclusive discord access, you know, like at, at five bucks and things like that. So, you know, we want to, we want to build a community. Um, and that, I, I guess that would be another point that I would say, like point number one, work together as a team, understand that you're going to be doing this for a while and you're not going to just be working on the game. Uh, point to build a community. I think that's, Sometimes that's the more important part about a Kickstarter. Like, yes, you want to get funded. You want to continue actually making the game you're making. Um, but you also want to build a community around it. And a Kickstarter does kind of make your project suddenly very real. You know, it's one thing to be making a game and then put it up on a on a website or, or you know, do press kit or something like that and tweet about it on Screenshot Saturday. But once you know, you go through the steps that you need to go through to do a Kickstarter, you know, namely all the business stuff and everything. Um, once it's launched, it's almost like your your game feels more real uh, very all of a sudden. Um, and part of that is that people will be like following you and asking to do podcasts uh, or, you know, interviews or things like that. And, you know, use that as an opportunity to like, build a discord, build, you know, your, your, uh, following and things like that. So, you know, that is a funded or unfunded. That's a benefit to a, a Kickstarter in my experience. Um, though obviously the funding is better cause then you, you're sure to keep making it, uh, you know, make sure, like I said, that you make graphics. So, you know, don't just use a header in the word, in the text editor, actually like make little graphic headers, make uh, stretch goal, you know, things, you know, we're doing our stretch goals based on like our funding goal is what like the minimum, what we could use to make, I guess, like the minimum viable product. Um, and that's not us just like teasing. That's, you know, us being realistic because um, the funding goal is going to be 70,000, but you know, that's well below like an average full games, but, but, you know, we're also realistic about what that'll be. Um, but you know, all these other things that we have laid out, you know, we sat down and we're like, okay, well, what's the budget? What would the budget be to have a game with that? And then th that's how we modeled our stretch goals. So don't, don't, you know, I would say, don't try to promise the world for the initial funding goal, you know, especially if you're smaller, you know, try to set like a reasonable expectation of what you can have for this. And then kind of like see if you can build up additional, like the dream part of it, um, pun kind of intended, uh, <laughs> you know, as you do, like really just, you know, be honest with your budget, be like, all right, you know, this is what you'll get if we can't get to this, but here's what we can do if you get to that. And and that is a another part of building a community is saying like, you know, you want people to believe in it. You want people to be like excited about getting um, the full experience. So you know, you, being able to talk to people kind of plainly, I think is, is really helpful. The other thing I would say is, you know, be aware that you're going to have, you, you know, you might have like an amazing first few days because you're on that, like just launched visibility level. Then you're going to have these like doldrums of like just the middle of the campaign where you feel like you are, you are uh, scraping for every dollar. And, but that's okay. Everybody has that. How you try to get through that is, you know, doing the annoying part of being, you, you and I were talking about this beforehand. You feel like you're being annoying by always being like, hey, everybody, you know, check out our Kickstarter. But, you know, you're really, you're doing your due diligence and, and it feels icky and I hate doing it personally, but you, you just kind of, it's the game. You have to play the game. So you have to do that that marketing stuff, even though it might feel weird. 
uh, really most people are probably just like, most people are, are probably rooting for you. So you don't always have to worry that, you know, you're annoying them. They're probably just like, oh man, I hope, I hope they do it. And with that, you know, one thing, the things that have gotten us through those times have been two things. One is doing stuff like this, where you do have interviews and you try to get a press thing. Cause, um, and don't, you know, don't ignore smaller websites, you know, like most big sites don't want to report on Kickstarters. So don't, don't be like reaching out to the Kotaku's and the game spots. You'll probably get more response from smaller sites that are just happy for content, but you see clicks from all of those regardless. Uh, you know, the, the day that I had La Mancha, uh, I did an interview for La Mancha with this like board game blog that had just launched. Um, I had my best day during the middle, that middle period, just because like I was out there and, and I had, you know, it, they had maybe a hundred followers on Twitter at the time. So, you know, everything is good. Every, you know, all that press is good, even if it's like small or new press. Um, the other thing that also really was helpful is saying, you know, our goal today is to do this. So, you know, you don't want to just get out there and be like, hey, we're at 25% of our goal. Let's get to 100%. Like, that's that's insurmountable. You want to just be like, hey, can we get to 30%, 40%, you know, 50%? And you, if you set those, like, achievable things, then people will be like, yeah, let's help them. Come on, everybody, let's go. Um, and so I think you know, setting, I guess, scaffolding goals when you are going through those periods is, is really nice. Um, so I think that's, that's important for people to remember is that, you know, yeah, you're staring down that, that funding goal, but what you want to do to get your audience, like to feel that they're almost, I mean, it's, it's like game design, <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't just have super Mario brothers and it'd be like, Hey, go save that princess. You know, it's like, go get to that flag, jump over that pit. Um, and that motivates people to keep going. These are all some great, great tips, man. Like, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing them with us. And just, uh, I don't know if you'd want to say the date or anything yet, mate, but uh, do you know when you'll be, I mean, can you say, mate, before I ask the question? Oh, this Kickstarter? Yeah. March 2nd. Brilliant. So March 2nd. I will be backing for all those as well. I will be putting a link down in the description below for who want to help this project come to life because it sounds friggin' awesome, mate. And I said, just super happy to just hear about it, man, because I'm very excited for you. It's yeah, I've I've had people um, I've had people call it just from like all the all the art that we've released. I've had people compare it to Studio Ghibli. Um, a friend of mine who's like, you know, a uh, game industry person who I don't want to, like, I haven't gotten his permission to do a direct quote. Um, but you know, like he's worked AAA and all this other stuff. Um, but he was like, Oh my gosh, it's like, it's like you did 80% McKay, but then like you got 20% Cuphead in there. Um, <laughs> you know, cause like one of our bosses actually does have like kind of a Cuphead setup like people have been really responding well to the artwork, well to the animation. Um, you know, they're excited about, like I said, the little Nemo thing coming back. Um, it's not a remake of the NES game, but we are, you know, trying to, you know, make things for those fans of that, of the movie, uh, of the comic, you know, we're, like I said, really cool platformer, fun, different characters. Um, you know, hand-drawn animation, uh, you know, we're, we're going, we're going for it. And uh, it's been, we're hoping that people want to, you know, make, make all these dreams come true. Like I said, the puns never end with this really. No, mate, you just got, you just keep giving the gift that keeps on giving here. This is awesome. All right, then we'll wrap this up. If you do want to reach out to Chris, how can they best contact you, mate? So I'm on Twitter at uh, totter87. I also have my studio, uh, Pie for Breakfast Studio. That is uh, PFB Studios. I'm also making the game. I can't emphasize this enough. I am making the game 
with Benjamin Cole of Pixel Please and Adrian Sandoval of Island Officials. Um, you know, but he's he's doing it as a as independent. Uh, and Tim Fritz, uh, who I work with uh, in my day job, you know, we're all collaborating. We've also worked with like a number of, uh, you know, we've been having students help us out through our through our internship program at the school, um, and we are making sure that they are credited. They're all going to be credited in the in the you know Kickstarter description and things like that. Uh, people listening, if you are offering jobs, hire my students. Um, <laughs> they're amazing, and they helped this happen. But, you know, you can reach me there, uh, you know, on Twitter, you know, as to the website for this, uh, it's at pie for breakfast studios, which is PFB And, uh, the games website is little Nemo game.com right now. It will, uh, forward you to the Kickstarter pre-launch page. So that'll, you know, turn into the Kickstarter page when the campaign launches. So go check them out. We're really excited. Um, and, and we hope you're excited too. Awesome, mate. I'm sure they are. If you want to reach out to me, you can do so on Twitter as well, which is at Max Pets. If you want to email in with any questions or anything, you can do so at lobby at gmail.com. And if you want to support the show, please head over to patreon.com forward slash level design lobby all of what we've just said both myself and chris will be links down in the description below for you to follow further thank you all very much thank you again chris and we will catch you all next time